hell, writing this isn't helping that book deal stereotype and will probably get me disappeared if I decide to actually publish this. But I figure that someone should know what happened to us. In the end, I hope this finds the right people and it brings some form of closure. Afghanistan, 1300 hours, local time. Tex? Hey, Tex, wake up. Skipper needs us in the skiff. Petty Officer First Class Smith spoke as he cracked open the door to our hooch. The ambient noise from the heavy machinery accompanied by the Afghan summer heat that smelled of human feces bled inside the cramped air-conditioned room as he stood in the doorway. The men and women of Camp Rattler were wide awake and going about their day, but it was still night for guys like us who were working vampire hours. I let out a quiet curse and plucked the pair of sunglasses off of the stand next to my rack and pulled them over my eyes before getting dressed and shuffling into a pair of shower shoes that were by the door. This shit better be worth it. I grumbled over to Smith, who handed me a small foam cup of black coffee as we joined the other five other operators who were huddled around the massive fire pit in the center of the small secluded compound inside the massive FOB. Well, considering you're up right now, I assume it is. Smith smirked as he scratched his bushy brown beard before running a hand through his shaggy hair. Oh, I forgot. You're an old man now, Tex. He grinned as the others talked among themselves. I can still kick your ass any day of the week, Smitty. I shot back as we walked across the courtyard that had a few other SOF teams lounging around and working out or cleaning their gear. We had been in country for three months. Our mission tempo had been high and kinetic. It was every operator's wet dream. Do you think this is about that shit back we snatched off the X from last night? The eager voice of Townsend, our newest team member, who had just made it through Green Team's grueling nine-month ANS pipeline, spoke up from beside me as we shuffled towards the plywood Fort Knox on the other side of the compound. Did you do something we need to know about? I mean, you were the last one with him after all. I asked, raising an eyebrow at him, as we approached two soldiers clad in full battle rattle, who gave us a nod and waved us through after we flashed our IDs. No senior chief, just speculating is all. Townsend finally responded as a pair of F-18s boomed over our heads before they banked off to the south. Despite the drawdown, the war was still in full swing for the men and women of Camp Rattler. About time, gents. Master Chief Brock, our team lead, greeted us with a nod and gestured towards the secure door behind him. Skipper's inside with some suit from Langley. So play nice, yeah? We all shuffled inside the cramped skiff and took our seats around the table in the center of the room. Despite the lame exterior of the building, the interior was the complete opposite. High-tech equipment lined the walls accompanied by small workstations along with a pair of LCD screens and digital clocks that sat above the skipper and our new nameless guest. Sorry for waking you all so soon, gentlemen, but this is very important. Our skipper apologized and walked to the head of the table. This is Carson. He gestured towards a man who was wearing a pair of Ray-Bans on his head, who looked like he got lost on the way to the golf course. Thank you, sir. The man shook our skipper's hand with a pearl-white smile and looked around the table with calculating eyes. Gentlemen, I'll make this quick. He pulled out a small black remote from his pocket and clicked the button. A few seconds later, the LCD screens behind him lit up with different images. Some were satellite photos, others were from ISR feeds. But they all showed what looked like a fortified entrance on the side of a mountain face. According to our Hume Int, in recent ISR feats, we uncovered an old Soviet-era weapons depot. Carson paused for a moment. Now intel suggests that the Soviets left experimental technologies and weaponry that are still sitting inside somewhere. We cannot risk the Taliban or any other group getting their hands on what is inside. Another image from an ISR feat showed three heat signatures sitting outside of the supposed entrance around a small fire. Master Chief, your team along with two members from mine will hit this target site and find out exactly what is inside before sealing the entrance. 
you have an AC-130 and two Apache gunships on standby if shit hits the fan. I couldn't help but grin at the thought of those angels of death watching over us. With that being said, recent reports are showing that Taliban activity in the area has spiked in the past 48 hours, so expect anything when you land. Carson gauged the room as we all took notes. Any questions so far? He asked as Smith raised a finger. Should we expect any of our Ruski friends to be on site? Smith asked as he tapped the table with his pen. Not to our knowledge, and if you do, don't fire unless fired upon. We don't need an international incident here. Carson answered, his voice sounding like an annoyed parent when their kid is asking stupid questions. Sir, what about potential CBRN exposure? I asked next, pushing my sunglasses to the top of my head as my leg bounced endlessly. There should be no life-threatening materials down there, Senior Chief. Does that answer your question? The man answered with a condescending tone. I was about to make a smart-ass remark, but Brock gave me the stop it or we will get our asses chewed look. After what felt like an eternity, we finally wrapped up things as hushed voices filled the room. I found myself thinking of the endless potential threats and scenarios that could unfold as the team dispersed and exited the cramped skiff. I'm Luke, and this here is Reyes. The CIA spoke in the corner of the room that remained silent up until now, introduced himself and the woman next to him as I passed him. Jason. I forced myself to stop and extended out an open hand towards him with a fake smile. Hope y'all can keep up. The hard-bodied woman with jet black hair, who was all of five feet tall, shook my hand with an iron grip and a fire in her eyes. You team guys seem to be all talk nowadays it seems. She retorted as Brock called them over to the table. That was my cue to leave. The hours passed like seconds, and we found ourselves all kitted up with tools of the trade while we waited for further instruction inside the courtyard. Out of boredom, my finger traced over the faded Texas flag patch on my ATAC case as I watched the rest of the team gather around the fire pit under the moonlit sky. These men are my brothers, my family, my team. Brock tapped my shoulder and pulled me from my thoughts. He cradled his helmet under his right arm and let his rifle hang by a sling. Is everything alright Jason? He finally asked as he ran a hand over his stubbled face. I'm solid, boss man, I finally answered and shifted my stance. But I'm not so sure about our new friends though. I gestured towards Reyes and Luke, who were talking with Carson on the far side of the courtyard away from everyone else. Brock just shook his head as he adjusted the Comtex mounted to the helmet before looking at me. You have us, brother, he gestured to the rest of the team. Now get your head in the game. Time to get evil. He held out a closed fist in my direction with a white grin. I grinned back, bumping his fist in response as the ten of us shuffled out of the compound and towards our waiting transport. In a matter of minutes, we were on a Black Hawk helicopter and tearing over the Afghan countryside under the cover of darkness. 30 seconds. Brock called out on comms over the roaring wind as he signaled around the cramped crew compartment that was bathed in a red glow. Shit, I must have fallen asleep. 30 seconds. I yelled in response, mirroring the signal around the crew compartment before checking over my kit one last time as my right leg hung limply out of the open cargo door. Feeling satisfied with the check, I snapped down the NVGs mounted to my helmet and peered out over the shimmering terrain that was now basked in the greenish-gray monochrome of night vision. I got tired of the blurry mountains in the distance and glanced back over my shoulder to see Reyes giving Luke a quick thumbs up before pulling out a small black device from her vest and pressing a button on it before sliding it back into its pouch. The helo banged hard to the right on its final approach, causing me to brace myself on the doorframe as the nose of the helicopter flared upward. It touched down in a small clearing and we dismounted in a matter of seconds before being left in complete silence. Two, take point. Brock's voice burst in my headset, shattering the dead silence. Moving. I stood up and pushed past Smith and the two other operators who were covering our six o'clock. I shuffled past Townsend and looked next. 
before finally passing Reyes, who was covering our 11 o'clock. According to the ATAC, the target site was supposed to be right down from the little clearing we landed in. Only, I wasn't seeing anything other than a small thicket of trees in our path. Where the hell is this stupid? My internal rant was cut off when a dark figure shifted positions in another small clearing to my front. I activated the IR laser mounted to my rifle, followed the figure as it walked back towards us. The faint sounds of talking were being picked up by my headset, but I couldn't tell who or what was talking. The figure finally stopped a few meters inside the thinly wooded area we were in, and the sound of water hitting rock filled my ears. Dude's taking a piss. Without warning, Reyes drifted past me in a low crouch with a knife in hand. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot? My hand shot out and missed the track strap on her plate carrier by an inch. She cleared the distance between them in a matter of seconds and managed to get the figure onto the ground. There was a small violent struggle before the two stopped moving. A few seconds later, Reyes was on her feet and signaled me to move forward. As I got closer, I could make out a typical man dress and a bulky AK ammo rig on the now dead man at my feet. A look of fear was plastered on his bearded face, and a long jagged cut had severed both carotid arteries and his trachea as a ragged wet hiss escaped from the new orifice. Reyes pointed towards one more fighter with his back to us, who was sitting in front of a dying fire with slouched shoulders. I nodded and unsheathed the Winkler tomahawk bound to the back of my kit as I maneuvered towards the unsuspecting fighter. My heart slammed against my chest like a drum as I closed the distance. Things were about to get very violent, very fast. I swung the blade down hard. It connected with the fighter's neck with a sickening wet crunch. The violent blow caused his head to snap to the side and almost come off. Cold droplets of blood hit my exposed wrists as the man fell on his side before I hit him in the temple with the spear point of the tomahawk. What the hell? He's already dead. We're clear. Reyes's voice was delayed in my headset as the rest of the team emerged from the wood line. There it is. Reyes spoke as she stepped past me and reached out, grabbing hold of a dark camo net. She pulled it down to reveal an ancient looking fortified bunker entrance with a faded star with a hammer and sickle in it painted on the door and overhead slab of concrete. More? Lucky? Police these bodies. Brock spoke in a whisper. He was holding two AK-47s by their slings as he walked over towards the entrance of the bunker. Gunner, Ike, Huston, pull security and join the other two and set up the inner cordon. Check. One of them responded. Brock looked over at me next. Jason, you, Townsend and Smith are with me in the suits. I gave him a thumbs up before wiping the blood of the tomahawk on the dead man's clothes before securing it back in the sheath. Luke walked up to the door and began messing with a small rusted panel. A few seconds later, the door let out a loud mechanical thunk. The reinforced metal door swung inwards with a loud screech, and the smell of mildew and rust hit my nose as I stepped up beside him. Ladies first. Reyes reached up, tapped my shoulder while gesturing down the white stairwell that led down into inky blackness. I ignored the jab and shoved past her with my rifle at the ready. Talk? Alpha One, we're going internal. Expect issues with calm soon. Brock's voice echoed from behind me as we continued the descent. We walked for another five minutes in silence before finally reaching the bottom of the stairwell. This place was a tomb, if anything. Paintings of Soviet leaders and other communist pieces were on the wall. Some old computers sat on a long abandoned desk at what looked like a guard station off to our right. To our left sat cobwebbed and dust caked lounge furniture and a coffee table with an old cigarette machine next to it. Check this out, senior. Townsend called out from my left as I looked around the massive room in awe. Senior? He called out again. What? I growled, turning to see Townsend holding up a mummified, severed arm, still clutching onto a tattered teddy bear. Something bad happened down here, bro. He wrinkled his nose and dropped the arm as Smith stopped at my side. Get ready to ditch the NVGs. He tilted his head towards the security station, 
and snapped his NVGs up. They're going to turn on the lights. Smith started chuckling as he walked over to Townsend in the dark. Wish you would have told me we were raiding your place, Tex. It's very retro. I gave Smith a single finger salute as we were blinded by a dull yellow flash of light that was followed by a short burst of static from what sounded like an intercom system as the two CIA spooks walked back over to us from the security station. Alright, stick close. This place is a fucking maze. Luke spoke as he took point through the door with his rifle raised. Any idea where we're going, Langley? Townsend asked as he stepped around a topple chair. According to... Reyes was cut off by a loud crash off to our right as we passed the darkened corridor. She activated the light mounted to her rifle to reveal a massive rat who was feasting on a mummified corpse wearing a Soviet-era officer's uniform that was leaning against the wall. She let out a quiet sigh and looked back towards Townsend. It's going to be further inside the main complex. Right now, we're in the receiving bay. She poked a thumb over her shoulder. This will go on for another... I stopped listening and scanned off to my left to find another corridor that looked like the one you'd see in a hotel. Doors lined both sides of the hall with metal plaques with numbers on them. Hell, it even had the same shitty carpet. Great. More walking. Townsend murmured as he checked our six. This place gives me the fucking creeps. Lock it up. Brock ordered as we entered a narrow corridor to our front that eventually opened up to a massive cafeteria section that had more bodies littered around it. The first place we need to stop at should be on our left. It's in one of the med bays. Reyes chopped her hand towards a set of double doors next to me. I grunted in response and pushed through the doors with my rifle raised, only to find scattered lab equipment and a toppled gurney with a brown dried stain on it that turned into a trail as I stepped past it with Reyes in tow. This isn't a weapons depot. The all too familiar putrid smell of death and rotting meat started to warm its way into my nostrils as we followed the trail around the corner to the right. As it finally stopped at another set of double doors that had a black putrid substance smeared on it, Reyes looked over at me and gave me a nod. Three, two, one. Afghanistan. 0 to 30 hours, local time. 3, 2, 1. We breached the door in unison, causing a thunderous crash to echo through the hall. As I cut right with my rifle raised, Reyes cut left and cleared her lane as the pale white lights inside the room flickered on and off, like some fucked up rave party. Flashes of metal on the wall caught my attention as I activated the light mounted to my rifle, giving me a steady source of light. In the corner sat a hunched figure trenched in more of that black liquid that was smeared on the door. I could barely make out the dress boots and faded green fatigues. Must have been another officer or grunt. My thumb was welded to the selector switch on my rifle as the figure shot up to its feet in one jerky motion. Stop! Let me see your hands! I ordered in English first while trying to think of the Russian phrase. The figure spun towards me on a heel and began to shuffle about like a drunkard. Hands! I shouted in Russian this time. The figure swayed and kept its course with staggering steps. I flicked the selector switch to bang and rested the red dot of my sight on his chest. Stop! Now! At first, I thought I had dry fired. Until Reyes passed me, she had a small portable camera in hand. She took another picture as the figure faltered and fell to the floor with a wet thud. Reyes, what the hell are you doing? I backed up with my rifle still trained on the figure as it let out a ragged moan. Documenting, she replied coolly as I tried to comprehend what the hell this thing was as it attempted to stand back up. Don't get any of that shit on you. She backed up a few steps and snapped another picture. Looks like tar or something. What the hell is it? I asked, scanning the rest of the room. We were in a morgue or holding room of some sort. Examination tables sat a few feet apart from each other, along with a few metal doors with observation slots that lined the wall. Hell if I know. She stopped as a loud bang came from one of the metal doors lining the wall to our left. 
Reyes pocketed the camera and swung her rifle towards the door. Shoot it! But this thing didn't have a gun or post any real threat at this second. That was the logic speaking. I shook that thought away and pulled the trigger three times. The tack 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 from the suppressed rifle sounded like miniature nuclear explosions inside of the confined room. The thing stumbled backwards a few steps. The third round had split the top of its head in half, causing a mass of brain matter, skull, to spill on the tile floor and wall behind it. To my surprise, the thing didn't go down. It regained its balance and let out another wet croak from its ruined head as the door to our left began to give way. Reyes, move! I backpedaled as the sounds of suppressed gunfire erupted from outside. Contact right! Contact right! Townsend called out as the metal door crashed to the ground. A hulking man wearing a sleeveless, blood-soaked Telniashka emerged from the now-open door. Americans! He bellowed with a hoarse voice as his blood-filled eyes locked with mine. I snapped my rifle in his direction and fired off three rounds that hit center mass. He just shrugged off the wounds and let out a blood-curdling scream while running towards us with outstretched arms. He barreled through Reyes, sending her to the floor and into me at full speed. The world suddenly turned into a blur as I fell onto my back through the set of double doors and into the hall. The sounds of weapon fire and yelling filled my ears as the giant of a man on top of me swung down with a closed fist that slammed into my helmet with a wet crack as he pulled back his mangled right hand with another scream. I couldn't get to the rifle that was at my side, so I left it and covered my face as he landed another blow that caused stars to float in the corners of my vision. Reyes! I thrashed around and bucked my hips in an attempt to get the guy off, but nothing was working. He was locked in and swinging wildly. I don't have a shot! Move! Reyes yelled back as I bucked again. This time, the man gave me just enough breathing room to get the clock on my battle belt. Just as the clock cleared the retention holster, the man swung down with another close fist that connected with my face, causing my eyes to water and a flood of blood to fill my mouth as I struck out with my free hand that connected with his chin. Through tears, I watched as the man pulled his fist back for another blow. Shit, this is going to hurt. I fired off one round that tore a hole through his shoulder that sent him into another screaming fit. As his fists came down, a flash of black and tan crossed my vision, and the man's head snapped to the side, causing his body to follow as the heavy weight lifted off my stomach. Reyes pumped several rounds into the man as she situated herself in the kneeling position beside me. The man groaned and clutched his mangled hand while trying to get his feet under him. You could? She asked as she swapped out magazines and trained her rifle down the hall. Good, I stammered as I got up to my feet and steadied myself on the wall before grabbing my rifle up off the floor. Down from us was a scene that reminded me of the old western movies I watched as a kid. Brock had hip-tossed a woman wearing a tattered lab coat over a table before shooting her in the face. Smith swung a plastic chair that connected with a uniformed man's face while Townsend and Luke were fighting a shirtless hulking man wearing a blue beret. What the fu- I was cut off by an iron grip that clutched onto my ankle, causing me to curse out loud. I glanced down to see the battered and angry face of the man who had punched me. I just simply tilted my rifle and fired off one round that obliterated his face in an explosion of blood and gore. His hand, however, still clutched my ankle. Moving! Reyes called out as I ripped my boot free from the hand that was still clutching at the air. We cleared the threshold of the cafeteria entrance and began selecting our targets while moving. One down, on to the next. My red dot found another target and my finger pulled the trigger, putting another person down. As soon as it started, it stopped. A mass of dead bodies now lay inside the hall and center of the cafeteria, surrounded by empty brass casings and bloody chairs. What the fuck is going on here? Brock yelled over at Luke, who was hunched over and dry heaving. The smell of cordite and blood hung thick in the air and was so strong that it was palpable. Luke just held up a hand and heaved once more as I checked in on Townsend and Smith. This was beyond fucked. 
And we obviously were left out on some key details here. Listen here, you son of a bitch. Brock suddenly snapped, grabbing the CIA's book by the straps of his plate carrier and standing him up straight. I'm not gonna risk the lives of my men if there's nothing to gain here. Spittle dotted Luke's face as Brock shoved him back. Weapons Depot, my ass, I muttered as Townsend smeared a line of blood on his cheek with the back of his gloved hand. This is something else entirely, so what is it? I asked, looking over at Reyes. We, oui. she avoided my gaze and began to speak, but Luke cut her off with a yell. Reyes, shut it! Master Chief, you are not in charge here. We are. Luke emphasized we as he pointed at Reyes. If you cannot proceed with the mission tasking, then go back outside and send in another person who will. I was stunned by the ballsy response from the CIA's book as he stared up at Brock with no emotion. Where do we need to go next? Brock asked, spitting a stream of blood onto the floor. He had a large gash on his right cheek, and his right eye was beginning to swell shut. He no doubt reflected my own busted face. I got what we needed from the med bay. We need to head into the director's office. Reyes answered. Fan-fucking-tastic. So if, and I mean if, we make it there, what are we doing next? Smith asked, as Rock checked in with the rest of the team that was still topside. We'll collect what we need while you pull fucking security. Luke interjected as I walked back into the clearing with my rifle at the ready. Any more questions? Our attackers looked aged and starved by decades, but still seemed to fight and move with ease. What the hell are these guys on? Jason, take point, Brock ordered, as we moved down the hall and through an open set of metal doors that led towards a cramped stairwell leading down into a smaller receiving bay. We walked for another 15 minutes before we arrived at a blast door that was surprisingly opened. Pied the corner to see another narrow hallway that was filled with more bodies and papers that were all over the floor. Moving, we cleared the door and were greeted by the sounds of bare feet slapping against the floor to our front. Every muscle in my body tensed as the footfalls grew closer and closer. Finally, after a tense moment of silence, a naked man rounded the corner holding a rusted kitchen knife in one hand and something else in the other. Nope. I fired off two rounds. One struck the man in the neck, and the second hit him in the jaw, causing him to spin like a top before falling to the floor. I approached the corner and took a peek. Beyond it was a group of them, all huddled together and twitching violently. As the rest of the team fell in behind me, I signaled that there was a massive group and pulled a flashbang from a pouch on my kit. The team gave me the acknowledgement, and I pulled the pin and tossed it around the corner. There was a bright flash and deafening thud that slammed my chest as the grenade detonated. The group in the hall went into a frenzy and started attacking one another in the chaos. We put them down with ease and pushed past their twitching corpses without a second glance. According to Reyes, we were getting closer to the director's office, but I couldn't tell where exactly we were. Everything looked the same. Reyes suddenly caught right and headed down a larger corridor that had closed office doors lining each side. This way. She stopped in front of a cracked door that had writing on it that said, Traitor, in faded black lettering. Reyes reached out and pushed the door open, only to be shoved back into the wall by an unseen force, followed by a low boom. My rifle found itself trained on the doorway as a fat man came strutting out with a double barrel shotgun in hand. The vapors from the black powder trailed up in lazy swirls as he tilted the barrel down at Reyes' face. What happened happened all too fast. One second, the fat man was standing there. And the next, he was slumped against the doorframe, missing the top half of his head. I was suddenly at Reyes' side with my rifle hanging by my side. Fuck that hurts. She coughed as I did a blood sweep, only to pull back a dry glove. The sappy plate in most of her magazines took the brunt of the damage. You live. It didn't penetrate. I got up and covered our flank, while Luke and Brock cleared the rest of the room. Shit. No, no, no. Reyes fumbled around the pouches 
and pulled out the small camera that was now busted. Shit, please, come on. She pulled out a small memory card that was still intact. Yes, thank you, God. Tex, you just mook checked Gorbachev's brother. Townsend joked, but it fell on deaf ears as Brock and Luke emerged from the room with an arm full of folders. Townsend pulled out a large yellow recovery bag from his assault pack and opened it up. There's more in there. Smith, help us. Brock stopped by Reyes and patted her on the shoulder. Can you walk? He asked, eyeing the exposed sappy plate. Yeah, but it hurts like a motherfucker. She responded through labored breathing. I guess that's karma for talking shit about your team guys, huh? I stifled a chuckle and winced as the sweat on my face made the cuts burn like a wildfire. We got it all. Let's move. Smith called out as I helped Reyes to her feet. Jason, you look like hell, brother. He grinned as he hefted the recovery back over his left shoulder. Feel like it too, I mumbled as he followed to look back down the hall. I checked my watch to see that we'd been down here for a few hours. The sun was no doubt going to rise soon, and we'd be a juicy target for any Taliban assholes who happened to wander over. As we retraced our steps, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling of being watched. Every so often, I'd check our six, only to find nothing. But every now and then, I swore, there'd be a small sliver of movement in the peripherals of my vision. Alpha? One? Con? The comms picked up a static field transmission as we finally made it back to the cafeteria section. See? No! A strained voice yelled. I was about to speak when something slammed into my back and knocked the wind out of my lungs as I landed face first onto the floor. Contact rear! Townsend called out as he let loose a burst of fire from his rifle. Texas hit! He's down! He pushed past me and continued to fire when the crown shook violently. My vision was washed out in a cloud of grey as the shooting continued. My lungs screamed for oxygen, but I just couldn't get the air back into them no matter how hard I tried. Oh shit, was that a fucking grenade? Someone yanked on the drag strap of my kit and pulled me around the corner and into the cafeteria before letting go. Is he dead? Luke called out as a cacophony of gunfire grew with each passing second. We have to go. Leave him. Fuck that. Smith yelled as another violent explosion shook the ground. Fuck, who are these guys? To my dismay, I could only see the ugly orange-colored wall inches in front of me as I sucked in the air that was thick with dust and cordite. Am I paralyzed? I let out a wet cough that sent a wave of pain throughout my entire body as I attempted to crane my neck. Hey, where the fuck are you going? Brock bellowed over the raging gunfire. Fuck, those CIA spooks fucking bolted. I was rolled onto my side, and I was greeted by the side of Brock, who was now covered in a thin coat of great dust particles. I need you back in the fight. He placed my rifle in my arms and set me up against the wall. Large group of tangos down that hall. We're gonna pop smoke, okay? I nodded in agreement and tried to stand. This only sent another wave of pain followed by a sickening nausea as I slumped back down. Listen, I need you to harden the fuck up and get ready to move. Brock tapped my shoulder and got back in the fight without saying another word. Smith rounded the corner with a limp and let his empty magazine clatter onto the floor as he ripped out another one from his kit. Fucker's got a PKM. He winced as rounds impacted the wall. I'm gonna chew our asses up if we don't take it out. Townsend? Move! He yelled, popping off a few shots that caused the gunfire to dampen for a moment. Townsend ran past us and down the hall in a dead sprint. Covering! He yelled out a second later. Smith pulled out a smoke grenade and pulled the pin. Moving! The smoke grenade made a puff noise, followed by a stream of white smoke as Smith threw it down the hall. Brock looked back down at me and helped me back up to my feet once more. Move it! He ordered. My brain gave the command to move, but my feet struggled to follow the orders. Each step seemed delayed and sluggish as I stumbled down the hall with Brock behind me. Come on, one foot in front of the other. I didn't dare to look behind us as we passed Smith and Townsend. 
the sounds of screaming mix with that damned classical music echoed out from behind us as the shooting began to dwindle. Every so often, there was the pop-up of a rifle. But soon, that stopped. I passed through the door first to be greeted by Reyes, who was covering the door, while Luke typed away on one of the computers at the security station. Jesus, I almost shot you in the fucking face. She changed positions and covered the other side of the door as I wheezed. Ignoring the almost fatal blue and blue incident, I spun around and posted up on the other door to see a horde of people running after Brock and the rest of the team. Close the fucking door! Smith screamed as he began to lag behind Brock and Townsend. Close it! Brock slid to a stop in front of me and spun around on one knee before firing into the massive crowd that was growing by the second. Townsend squeezed through the door and watched our flank before shooting at something. I didn't take my eyes off the growing horde and continued to fire as Smith made it to Brock. Just as the two men made it through the gap, an alarm sounded and the door began to close at a slow pace. Great. Brock cursed and ripped a fragmentation grenade from its pouch on his kit and prepped it. Frag out! He tossed a small explosive through the gap. Less than a second later, there was a thump as the explosion rocked the ground, sending pieces of shrapnel pinging off the metal door as it sealed shut. Shit! Help! Townsend cried out from my left as he was toppled to the ground by two decrepit-looking figures that had emerged from one of the rooms. Get them off! He pleaded as they dragged him back into the room. I shifted my stance as four more of the mummified-looking people came running out from the darkness and towards Smith and Reyes. The two laid into them with a controlled burst, dispatching them without issue. I'm out! Reyes called out as she transitioned to her pistol. Smith attempted to push forward, only to be stopped by more of those fucking things. Townsend, hang on! Townsend's screams were soul-crushing, but more of those things kept pouring out from the rooms as we emptied magazine after magazine. Hang in there, kid! Brock yelled again as we fought our way down the hall at a slow pace. I breached into the room with Brock to find Townsend sprawled out on the floor with two of those things tearing at his exposed lower stomach. The coppery smell of blood hit my nose as I shot the one closest to me while Brock shot the other. You're going to be fine. Brock tore into Townsend blowout kit. It's just a scratch. He reassured him as Reyes and Smith continued firing from outside. Brock shoved most of Townsend's exposed intestines back in and dressed the wound before securing it in place. The bottom two fingers on Townsend's right hand were torn off and his left wrist had been broken at an odd angle, rendering it useless. Jason, help me! Brock gestured toward Townsend as he grabbed the hold of his right arm. I hooked mine on the Townsend's left arm and hauled him up to his feet. His face was beginning to turn pale as blood began to seep through the trauma pad on his stomach. I don't... His eyes fluttered. Feels so good. Um, I'm sorry guys. He slurred the apology as he tried to walk. I kinda fucked up. He coughed up blood that streamed out over his chin. Um, gonna die? Townsend struggled to walk as we moved back down the hall. Luke had joined the fighting now and was making his way up the stairwell we had entered from. Don't forget the back. The yellow back sat against the wall of the security station all the way across the room. Fuck that! Help us! Smith yelled back as he dropped one of those mummy things and planted a boot in its skull, sending a putrid black fluid floating onto the floor. Luke let out a curse and ran across the room, dodging the few stragglers that were still alive. Just as he got to the back, something slammed into the massive blast door that we shot just moments earlier. The door shuddered violently as he slung the back over his shoulder. Get your men to prep explosives on the entrance. We need to block it off. He yelled up at us as the door cracked open. Brock gritted his teeth as we slowly ascended the darkened stairwell. Screams were echoing up from behind us now, and it wouldn't be long before those things were on top of us. Austin, prep explosives for that. We're closing the entrance. He released the PTT button and activated the light mounted on his helmet. 
Townsend's body suddenly went limp. His dead weight nearly caused us to tumble backwards. But luckily, I was able to catch my balance and kept him from dragging us down. Townsend, I need you to walk, buddy. Hey! I tried to get a response, but got none. He's gone. Brock spoke. His voice was raw and hoarse. There was a sudden rush of cold air as we neared the top of the stairs. My back and arms burned and my legs felt like they were weighed down by lead. As we reached the entrance, smoke from a smoldering fire wafted in our direction as the rest of our team all looked at us in shock. There were pockmarks in the door and around the entrance along with what looked like blast damage from an explosion. We need to clear out and- Luke was cut off by a swift punch from Brock. The blow split the spook's lip up to his nose. Look, Ike, help transport Townsend. The two men didn't say a single word. They just walked over to me and took Townsend's lifeless body from me before laying him down near the wood line. More, Gunner, what the hell happened up here? Brock asked the two operators who looked like they'd been put through hell. A group of Taliban decided to drop by. We dealt with them. Moore answered as Huston began fixing the explosives to the weak points on the structure. Chargers are set, boss. Huston spoke up a minute later as he led the command wire away from the charges that he positioned around the engines. I have a one minute fuse set on standby. I finally let out a long ragged breath and checked over myself to find no life threatening wounds. Whatever those things were, they didn't seem to be faced by physical trauma. My gaze drifted over to Townsend's lifeless body. His arms were folded across his chest and his rifle was by his side. He didn't deserve this. I finally tore my eyes off of Townsend and they found themselves on Reyes, who was tending to look. All right, almost here. Get ready to move. Smith stated as he walked over to the two. This intel better be fucking worth it. He glared down at Luke who just shook his head. Who am I kidding? You're all the same. You just get us killed and get the credit for a job well done, am I right? Smith kicked Luke's leg, causing the man to spring to his feet. Fuck off! Luke growled in response as I pulled Smith back by the arm. Let it go. This isn't the time nor place, brother. I tightened my grip on his arm as the rest of the team began to file into the woods. Let's go. Come on. The two spooks trailed behind us without saying a word. They had a lot to answer for. This isn't over yet. Afghanistan. Time unknown. We pushed through the thicket of trees and made our way back towards the exfil point in a staggered column as an eerie silence washed back over us. I found myself glancing down at Townsend's body. One minute, he had been bitching about to walk down into that fucking bunker. And now, he was gone. How was his family going to handle this news? Would they even hear about it? Would these assholes cover it up and say that he died an honorable death? Or would they just sweep it under the rug? Heads down. Dead in three, two, one. Hudson cut it down as the explosive charges detonated with a thunderous boom that reverberated to the Afghan countryside. If they didn't know they were here, they do now. One of the operators spoke as pieces of rubble and rock pelted our helmets. A bit later, something came crashing through the underbrush towards us as the low familiar thud 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 of our transport helicopter grew louder as it closed in on our location. My heart skipped a beat when a man emerged. It was the asshole that I had shot in the face after the fist fight. Despite all odds, he survived and had escaped the bunker. He was missing the right arm up to the shoulder and the majority of the left hand as he ran towards us with a mouth curled up in a snarl. The bastard was cut down in seconds by the team as another wounded figure appeared next. The helicopter touched down in the clearing behind us and the wounded figure darted back into the trees. Move! I called out as we were engulfed in dust and debris from the rotor wash. I covered Hudson and Gunner as they moved Townsend. Last man! 
Smith yelled as he tapped my shoulder and moved past me. Just as I turned away, tracer fire ripped through the tree line and barely missed my legs as one of the rounds ricocheted off the ground and into the sky. Another had found the cockpit window and caused the glass to spiderweb in all directions as the pilots yelled into their headsets. The door gunner gritted his teeth and swung his massive gun towards me, returning fire without hesitation. Fifty caliber rounds cut down the small ferns and trees in its path as the gunner laid down the hate. I hefted myself up into the cargo bay and sat in the open door, snapping down my NVGs in the process. The NVGs flickered between a dim and bright glow as I returned fire at a small group of Taliban fighters who emerged from the tree line with AKs in hand. Reaper 6, Neptune Actual, I need you to fire on my target, marked by IR Lasso. Be advised, danger close. Brock spoke to the AC-130 crew as the bird lifted off into the sky. Copy Neptune Actual, stand by. The helicopter lurched upward and banked hard to the left as we gained altitude. Rounds away, TOT, 10 seconds. One of the crewmen spoke as a low based thump followed by a swoosh cut over the churning of the rotors. The small patch of land we were just on went up in a dark cloud of dust behind us as a 105mm howitzer round splashed down. The 25mm gun buzzed next and rained hell down into the area followed by a few shots from the 40mm Bofor cannons that sounded like distant war drums. Neptune Actual, Outlaw 1-3. Be advised, we have multiple heat sticks moving through the sticks down towards the river. A female voice called out over the net. Outlaw, those are tangos. Smoke them. Copy. The gunship fired a salvo of its Zuni rockets and let off a short burst from its 30mm cannon as more tracer fire lagged lazily behind us. The whole damn valley seemed to come alive at that moment. They're not getting back up from... The gunship pilot was cut off as an RPG streaked out from the foliage below us and towards them. RPG! RPG! The gunship pulled hard to the left, just missing the projectile by a few inches as they returned the favor with a long burst from their 30mm cannon that demolished the patch of foliage that the RPG had been fired from. Neptune Actual, Reaper 6, we are Bingo Fuel and RTB. Good luck. The AC-130 let out another stream of fire from all weapons platforms before heading back towards the FOB. I glanced down to see more muzzle flashes and RPG fire coming from all over the valley. My eyes went wide as a tracer round scored a direct hit on the gunship escorting us, causing it to spew a stream of fire, followed by black smoke from the turbines as the pilot fought to gain control of the aircraft. Shit, we're hit. I'm losing hydraulic fluid fast came the gunship pilot's clipped response as our bird was peppered by another wave of incoming fire. Can you make it back 1-3? The second gunship's pilot asked as they tore over the mountainous terrain on our right flank. Everyone inside the crew compartment let out curses and grabbed onto what they could as the helicopter shuddered violently. It was one thing to be shot at on the ground. We could at least return fire and fight back, but we wouldn't win a fight against gravity. Yeah, I think we can, but she ain't going to hold for much longer. We're going to have to make an emergency landing at Camp Bastone. One three finally responded with a cough. The shooting stopped, and so did the adrenaline dump. My body hurt with a pain like no other, along with my left leg that had caught pieces of spalling from the bullet that had ricocheted off the ground. Easy day. I snapped my NVGs up and let out a long, ragged sigh, leaning my head against the net bench behind me. The next few hours were going to be hell. The sun was rising now, turning the pale grey sky into a bloody orange color as we finally arrived back at Camp Rattler. After touching down, we moved Townsend's body to the camp's medical facility where we got checked out by the army doctors and nurses before we said our silent prayers and goodbyes to our fallen teammate. Dude, how are you not fucking paralyzed? Ike asked bluntly as we made our way back towards the compound for the after action report. He held the seppi plate that was in my back panel. A jagged hole was in near the bottom where the round from the unseen shooter had gone through 
and lodged itself in my back along with chunks from the plate. Lucky, I guess, I responded while gingerly touching my lower back. I had no clue how that round had stopped where it had, but according to the duck, it was a miracle that the bullet had missed my spine. Miracle or not, it still didn't explain how the internal trauma surrounding the bullet had been close to nothing other than an irritation to the surrounding side itself. It was like the wound had healed itself in a matter of minutes. Carson and our skipper had both been present in the talk the entire time we were on target, and it was evident that they only saw what happened on the outside. Though Carson's body language led me to believe, he knew more as they began the after-action report. It wasn't until we were done with the after-action report that Reyes produced a helmet-mounted camera along with a small flash drive that she handed over to Luke. Brock, Smith, and Jason, I need you to stay put. The rest of you are dismissed. The rest of the team looked at one another in confusion and anger. They were left in the dark as to what had happened down there in that bunker and wanted answers as much as we did. Gentlemen, Carson spoke with a very calm tone as he shut the reinforced door. What you witnessed down there was something you will not speak of under any circumstances. He handed us three sheets of paper to each of us. Please sign your full names at the bottom of each one. I looked over the document and noted that it was some form of NDA that would land us in some serious shit if we signed it. Oh, here we fucking go. Smith shoved the paper back across the table and stood up. I'm not signing shit. He stood in defiance. You can't do this to us. I joined in as Brock's hands balled up into fists at his side. Dried blood still coated the sleeves and neck of his combat shirt. I can and will, senior chief. Luke looked over to our skipper and shook his head. I know you're all going through a lot right now. The skipper rested his arms against the table and looked at each of us as he spoke. I need you. The team needs you. Please. He gestured towards the paper. Sir, can we have the room? Luke spoke as he emerged from the corner of the room with his arms crossed. Our skipper stared down at the man across from him. He wasn't used to being told what to do, especially by some suit from Langley. Carson let out a long sigh, followed by a laugh that was void of all humor. I'll just be blunt with you, since playing nice isn't working anymore, sir. He planted a finger in our skipper's chest. Your men are about to be sent off to prison for treason and the murder of a fellow service member. There was a tense moment of silence, followed by a growl from our skipper. I'll be back. Keep your mouth shut. That's an order. Without saying another word, he walked out of the room with Luke following close behind him. The Russians were experimenting with different ways to treat battlefield injuries faster. Reyes finally spoke as she took a seat across from us. And the only reason we know this is because the company has been in contact with one of the lead scientists and the director inside that bunker since the Soviet invasion. Brock slammed his fists into the table, causing Reyes to jump. So you fucking knew that those things were down there? Brock asked as the veins on his arms bulged. No, we didn't know anything about them. We lost communications with the director as of three days ago. And after trying every possible means of contact, we decided to use an alternative option. Carson butted in. We uncovered a terrible secret. And if anyone else knew what was going on down there, the geopolitical fallout would be. He was cut off as the door opened. Luke entered and shut the door behind him. A look of worry and fear was plastered on his boyish face. Sir? He's bringing MPs and the rest of their team back here. Carson let out a curse and looked back over to us. If you sign those NDAs, you can continue to operate freely without any issue. This is just a means of keeping things on the wraps. Fear was in the man's eyes and we were drawn to it like sharks to blood. What about Townsend's family? I asked, tapping on the paper with my index finger. His family will be taken care of. They don't have to worry about any financial burdens for the rest of their lives. He answered quickly. 
And what about us? Smith asked, gesturing to me and Brock. We signed these papers, and you expect us to live with the fact that you got one of our guys killed for some fucked up meet and greet? Look, we don't have much time left. Carson was on the verge of hysteria as I tried to make sense of what was going on. Ebola, the bubonic plague, SARS, smallpox, they're all nothing compared to what they've engineered down there. Luke joined the conversation. The director that you shot in the head was supposed to give up the location of the other bunkers so we could shut this little experiment down for good. I looked down at the papers and read through them twice. I went in. The room fell silent at my response. I want to shut down every last one. You let me do that, and I'll do whatever you want me to. We can't do. Luke began to argue, but was waved off by Carson. Done. You'll be working with Reyes and Luke's team. Just sign the paperwork, and I will handle the rest of the logistics. A look of relief washed over Carson's face as I put the pen to paper. Brock and Smith's eyes were burning holes into me, but I didn't bother looking at them. I couldn't. I'm doing this for Townsend and for the team. I signed the papers and stood up. The door swung open and the skipper along with the rest of our team and two MPs wearing multicam uniforms entered. Stand down, Carson ordered as the tension in the room began to skyrocket. Everything has been handled accordingly. Our skipper looked over at Brock for confirmation. Brock just simply nodded in response as the MPs awaited further instruction with their hands hovering over their drop leg holsters. I guess that settles it then. Smith spoke next as he stood up from his table and left the room. I hope you know what the hell you're doing, Jason. Brock stood and walked over to the rest of the team. We're good here, gents. Clear out. He ushered the hellbent operators back outside, telling them what they wanted to hear as the searing light from the sun illuminated the darkened interior of the room. I looked down at the other papers to see Brock and Smith's names scrawled on them. I'll be damned. Afghanistan. Time unknown. I found myself wandering over to a small secluded section of the compound that overlooked the flight line and western section of the camp. This wasn't my first time losing a team member, but it wasn't something you get used to no matter how long you've been in the business. You wanna smoke? A familiar voice asked from somewhere behind me. I'm good, thanks. I twisted around to see the agency woman with a cigarette hanging from her lips. Her hair was let down and free-flowing like her current attitude. Understandable, I only smoke if it's been a real shit day. She smirked, alighting the cowboy killer and inhaling deeply before blowing out a plume of tobacco smoke. What happened? I asked, hoping that our agreement was still being honored. Well, Carson was able to get you leased out to us after a long fight with your command. Needless to say, they're pissed, but it's done. She took another long drag. Luke and the rest of the team are on standby in Paris, and are waiting for further instruction. Paris? Is that our AO? I leaned back against the stack of Connex boxes leaning against the fence. Starting to look like it. Our people are still putting together a target package. What's our timeline here? I asked, getting to the point. I'll read you in once we're wheels up. She leaned on a spool of sea wire and reached into the cargo pocket of her combat pants. And since no one else is around to question your arrival, Ray has held out a small black rectangular patch housing a dark red skull being pierced through the top by a dagger. Welcome to the team, Jason. I traced over the patch as Reyes shifted positions. I'm going to tell you this now, so you don't have to experience it all on your own. She took another long drag from her cigarette while looking me in the eyes. What you will experience while working with us will keep you at night. It will drive you to the brink of insanity and will destroy everything you hold dear if you let it. What you experienced down in that bunker was just the tip of the iceberg. Her tone was serious despite her relaxed demeanor. Don't let it break you. A look of pity or maybe even longing flickered behind the woman's blue eyes 
as she stopped out the cigarette. The hard-ass, cold-blooded CIA spook returning now. Make a phone call. Say your goodbyes. Do what you have to do. We leave in ten. Ray is left without saying another word, as two Black Hawk helicopters carrying members of our sister squadron tore over the horizon. Our time here on this ancient blood-soaked stretch of land was coming to an end, and they would be picking up where we left off for the next couple of months. Friends. Time unknown. We were greeted by an unmarked SUV that sat idling. A man with full sleeve tattoos wearing a Slayer t-shirt stepped out of the vehicle as we stepped off our flight and crossed the tarmac. Who's your new boyfriend, Reyes? The man called out as he got back in the driver's seat. Fuck you, Keith, was Reyes' only response to the tasteless dick as we climbed in and situated ourselves. Since you've been busy in the rock pile, I'll fill you in. Keith spoke as he drove us towards another group of hangars off to the south. Carson has accelerated the timeline to tonight. He turned the radio up as an RHCP song began to play. Oh man, I love this song. Get back on task. Reyes growled over the intro of Snow. As I was saying, Keith mocked Reyes with a gruff voice. We have six GIG and operators that will be joining us on this little snatch and grab. He turned down the radio as we passed a group of people in flight suits who were assessing a helicopter. The hired gun and I will be on assault team one with Peter and you. Keith stopped for a brief moment as he looked in the rearview mirror. You look familiar. You a team guy? Something like that. You? I asked in response, trying to remember who exactly this guy was, but came up empty as we hit a rough patch on the tarmac. Did a stand in Team 4 before joining the company. A grin spread across Keith's face as we stopped in front of an open hangar to our right. Inside sat a line of parked vehicles along with a large group of people in civilian clothing who were huddled in the middle of the barren hangar. Sorry for the hold up, hit some traffic and picked up a stranger on the way back. Keith jabbed a thumb at me as we walked over to the large group. No worries, we were just getting started. Luke's voice echoed around the room up as he walked out from the group and gestured towards a large whiteboard situated near the wall. Our target has been hiding out at this apartment complex. Luke referenced a photo of an old Middle Eastern man with a cloudy right eye and a local map that detailed the surrounding area. The target building was a massive apartment complex outside of the major city hub, and from what I was seeing, there were multiple means of egress from the blueprints that were provided. Peter, if you will. Luke stepped to the side as a shorter man with short cropped black hair and a clean shaven face walked over to the table. Our HVI, known as Tolman, was seen frequently entering and leaving room 105 on the fourth level here. He pointed towards a photograph of the complex's exterior. This place is full of gangbangers. Most of them are armed with a variety of weaponry, ranging from rifles to handguns, so expect anything. Now gentlemen and women, he glanced over at Reyes, who just rolled her eyes. There's a heavy civilian presence here, so watch your fire and make sure to PID your targets. Keith pulled a hat over his head, causing his shaggy blonde hair to poke out from the sides, making him look like a typical surfer bro from Cali. The weapons we are going to be using are linked to a weapons bust, so glove up. Peter turns towards me as he tapped on the table. Assault Team 1 will take point through this side entrance here. Expect limited contact until we reach the fourth floor. Teams 2 and 3 and 4 will breach from here and here before setting up the inner and outer cordons. He continued with the assault plan as I took in the details from the floor plans and surveillance photos of our targets. Now, the police response time for this area is 5 to 10 minutes, but the cell jammers will give us some extra time. Any questions? Peter asked engaging the silent room. All right then, let's do this. Friends, 0100 hours, local time. My hands ran over my kit in one final check, as the rest of the plain-clothed operators in the cramped sedan went about their pre-game rituals. It was time to get some answers. 
Team 4 is in position. Team 4's leaders bust in my earpiece as Keith chambered around in his M4 in the front passenger seat. Copy 4. One is about to reach Rhine. Stand by. Carson's voice responded as Peter steered the sedan into a parking spot across from the target building. One is in position. All teams stand by. Peter released the PTT button bound to his kit and looked around at all of us. His balaclava sat on top of his head, making him look like a fisherman. It's time. Keith pulled down his mask before adjusting the sling of his rifle and giving Peter a nod. Time to get evil. Reyes pulled the skull balaclava down over her face as I did the same. All teams go. I exited the car and followed in behind Peter with my rifle at the ready as he led the way towards the side entrance. Loud club music thumped from inside like a dull pulse as the civilians lounging around outside watched us in awe. Somewhere off in the distance, a dog barked wildly as a couple argued loudly outside of our view from the darkened archway to our left. Move, Keith ordered from behind me as he shoved the man smoking a cigarette who tried to stop him. One has made entry. Peter led the way up a cramped spiral staircase to our front as our radios came alive with traffic. Inside, inside. He waved off a group of kids playing with a soccer ball as we made it to the third deck. The kids finally scattered when we threatened one while covering an open door to our right. Here, Peter called out from the next flight as he dipped through a set of double doors. I acknowledged the call out and cleared the threshold with my rifle at the high, ready to see Peter moving a woman and her two children back into their room, as a man down the hall sitting in a chair spun towards us with a sawed-off shotgun in hand. Time seemed to speed up as the door to my left opened inward. A man holding a pistol in one hand and a phone in the other filled my vision. Drop it! I ordered in clipped French, snapping towards him with my rifle raised as he began to lift the weapon. A look of anger spread across his face. I flipped the safety off and fired off a short controlled burst into his chest, dropping him in the doorway as a woman ran out of the room next, almost getting shot in the process. I peeled away from the door, scanning for more targets, only to see the dead man with the shotgun at the end of the hall as I caught back up to Peter, as he cut left down another white corridor filled with more scrambling civilians. It's the middle door on the right. He called out over the screams and familiar reports of M4s followed by smaller caliber weapons. Check, watch your fire, we need him alive. I reminded the Frenchman as he pushed past the row of open windows next to us. All teams be advised, you have more vehicles arriving outside, counting 12 armed tangos. Carson's voice was calm despite the unfolding chaos inside the complex. Two men appeared at the end of the hall with assault rifles in hand as Peter keyed his PTT button. Shit. I laid down suppressing fire in an attempt to cover our advancement as Peter ducked into an open room to our left. Jason, in here! My M4 ran empty as I fell through the open doorway and onto the hardwood floor. Out! Out! Get out! A woman wailed from somewhere inside the room as I scrambled up to my feet. Shut up and get down! Peter yelled back at the woman as the wooden door frame and pieces of wall exploded into splinters and dust particles as the men down the hall returned fire. Reyes, Keith, two shooters at the end of the hall were pinned in room 102 on the left hand side. I released the PTT button and thumped the Mac release, letting the empty magazine fall to the ground. Copy, hang on. Keith responded over the roaring gunfire as I slammed in the fresh magazine. Jason, move, we have them pinned. I slapped the bolt release and slowed my breathing as I pushed back out into the hall with my rifle raised. I took aim and fired at one of the shooters at the end of the hall. With the upper half of his body exposed, my rounds all hit their target and he fell into a heap on the floor dead next to his body that clutched onto his stomach and groin while crying out in pain. On to the next. A fat, shirtless man with a scrappy beard exited from room 105, holding a handgun as I reached the door. He didn't match the target photo in my plastic wrist case. I pulled the trigger twice, and the two rounds from my M4 connected with his neck and jaw as I pushed past his now lifeless body. The doorway opened into a smaller hallway with two doors that sat staggered across from one another before opening into a larger living room at the end. One door on the right side of the hall opened, and a woman holding a baby appeared 
as I cleared the main entrance with the rest of the team following close behind. Not an active target. Move to the next. I pushed past her as Peter took control of that room. As I passed the second door, a dull boom sounded from inside as a large chunk of the door exploded outward, sending wooden splinters into my arms and face as something hard slammed into my chest. Keith returned fire through the wall as I fell into the living room. Keith, watch your fire. Tolman might be in there. I sputtered as waves of pain shot through my chest. Just as I finished speaking, another door opened from a kitchen area across from me. A tall, thin man with a cloudy right eye matching the target photo emerged holding a pistol in his right hand and a small black device in the other. My heart sunk as the realization set in. That's a fucking ass vest. He's rigged to blow. I cleared the distance in a matter of seconds, ignoring the pain in my chest as the pistol in his hand barked. The concussive blast rattled my skull as flames licked the corners of my vision. It felt like someone hit me in the side of the neck with a sledgehammer covered in razor blades as we both crashed through the door he exited from. This is it. I expected to go up in a bloody explosion. But to my surprise, it didn't happen. The man shot up to his feet and attempted to grab for the device again, but I grappled him in a front headlock and performed a gator roll. We got some distance between the device as I swung down with a closed fist that connected with the man's nose. Blood and mucus spewed down his face and onto his shirt as I landed another blow that hit with a sickening wet crunch. Tolman looked back up at me with eyes wide full of terror as he thrashed around frantically. The rhythmic sound of my heartbeat filled my ears as the blood rushed to my head. Blood splattered onto his face as I pushed the detonator further away with my boot. With a curse and one final swing, Tolman's head snapped to the side. His body finally went limp as the searing pain in my neck became unbearable. My hand shot to my neck, sticky warm blood pulsed against my gloved hand as I attempted to slow the bleeding, but it wasn't doing much as I fought to stay upright. Shit, Jason is hit! Reyes called out as she entered the room. This is it. I'm dying. She pulled me off of Tolman and secured his hands behind his back with a pair of flex cuffs before tearing into my blowout kit. Hang in there. She pulled my hand away and pressed a wad of combat gas and blood clotting agent against the wound. Keith, get in here! Reyes looked down and tapped my face with her free hand. Jason, you need to press this down for me, okay? I tried to speak, but a terrible wet gurgling sound came out as blood filled my mouth and throat. Keith! She shouted again, only to be answered by more gunfire in response. Shit, I'm sorry. She reached over, hooked her arm under Tolman's in an attempt to drag him out of the room. All teams, jackpot! I say again, jackpot! Get ready to move! The room began to spin as Keith appeared at my side. Hang in there, bro. I'm going to get you out of here. He hooked an arm around my chest and struggled to pull me to my feet. The burning subsided, but the spinning did not. It was like being plastered drunk, but tenfold as I struggled to walk into the living room. We're moving, Peter called out as he pushed out into the hall with Reyes and the handcuff men. The world went black and I woke in the back seat of the sedan as Reyes drove like a bat out of hell. We're coming up to the gate now. Have medical on standby. The sedan screeched to a halt and the back door was ripped open. A pair of hands grabbed a hold of my arms and pulled me out of the back seat and onto a gurney, pulling up my balaclava in the process. Another hand tore the bandage off of my neck, and all movement stopped. I thought you said he was critical. The masked surgeon standing above me asked as he prodded at my neck with his gloved hand. He... Rhea stammered as she put a hand on my neck. He was. I coughed and spat out a stream of blood as the group spread out. Where's Tolman? My voice wasn't my own. It was raw and ragged. Jesus, horror! Peter was taken aback by the sight as I fought to get to my feet. Where is he? I asked again, rolling off the gurney and taking a step with a foot that didn't want to comply. I need to talk to him. The world went black once more.
CIA black site. 0900 hours. Local time. The smell of diesel combined with the salty coastal breeze from the ocean caused my skin to burn and my mouth to dry as we entered the concealed housing area for the high-profile detainees that still had valuable intel to dish out. All around us, the sounds of death metal, classical music, nursery rhymes, and other musical pieces washed over the screams that were coming from the other buildings within the compound. If hell existed on earth, this place was one step in the right direction. How are you feeling? Keith asked in a barely audible whisper as we approached a reinforced door being flanked by two armed guards dressed in civilian clothing holding Sopmot M4s across their chests. I ignored the question and flashed my security badge. Reyes gave them a simple nod and they opened the door before stepping off to the side as we entered the small holding room housing a single metal table and a few chairs along with one occupant. Sitting in the metal chair across from us was Tolman. His face was gaunt and expressionless as he looked up with me with his one remaining eye. He suddenly muttered something in Farsi before falling silent as I sat across from him. Talk. Tolman's eyes met mine as he looked for anything to use. But after a minute of silence, he just chuckled. It worked. He finally spoke. What worked? I asked, scratching at the fading scar tissue that formed where the bullet had penetrated my neck. What those crazy Russians have been trying to perfect over the past few decades? He answered as I tried to keep calm. Afghanistan, there was a bunker. The old man's eyes narrowed. We went down there and found the aftermath of that little experiment. Whatever they tried to perfect failed. Tolman shook his head in disagreement as I shifted in my seat. No, no, no. You are mistaken, American. They succeeded. The corners of his lips began to curl into a smile. And how is that? I asked, intrigued by the old man's confidence. By the fact that you're sitting across from me. I jumped up to my feet, causing the metal chair to slam into the ground and the rest of the team to jump as I rounded the table. Where are the other bunkers? Who is in charge of the operation? I asked, grabbing Tolman by the collar of his yellow prison jumpsuit. South America. Africa. And Russia, of course. Tolman punctuated each word as he spoke. Who is behind all of this? I asked again, giving him a heart shake. You're talking to him 